Hey everybody, it's John Wheatcroft here again with another Sunday Q&A. We're up to week number 42 and uh, it's going to be a short and sweet one this week I'm afraid. I hope you'll indulge me. Uh, it's been such a busy weekend. Uh, yesterday I did a great masterclass for Dave and the guys at the London Jazz Guitar Society. I really urge you to check them out and to support them. They do some really great things. Uh, but that's inspired this week's tune of choice. I'm going to do Django Reinhardt's ubiquitous minor swing. Um, incidentally, the bass player who plays on this track, this particular track, is the great Mark Rose, and he fielded one of the questions that I'm going to cover today. So I hope you enjoy this tune. Uh, yeah, time is tight tonight. I've got one of those Zoom meetings with a, a band that I was in many years ago and various members in various different parts of the world. So it's one of the advantages of Zoom, I guess. It's what, one of the fringe benefits that's come from this pandemic is that we've all learned how to connect with each other uh, via the internet. And it's become, you know, conference calling has become such a great thing. And it's allowed us to reconnect with uh, friends and colleagues who maybe uh, the geography of it just would not generally allow. But, but Zoom and very similar things, video calling allows us to do this. It's also changed the way that various sessions take place. I've done quite a lot of those remote recordings where Myself, I'll record my part and then we'll send it off to Filippo Dallaster or Aunt Law or any of those great guitar players. And we'll all contribute our parts remotely, come together uh, to collaborate and hopefully it sounds cohesive as a whole. Anyway, I'm going to get to it. So I hope you enjoy, enjoy the tune. It's just going to be a short and sweet version of Minor Swing. And then I'm going to get to the questions. Take care. I hope you enjoy this and I'll see you after the music. <laughs> Mark's question related to the caged system, it's something that I've mentioned many times and it will benefit maybe some clarification. I think possibly I may just assume that everyone understands what I'm talking about when I say that's a C form idea or that's an A form idea. So maybe that's an assumption too far. So in this instance, what I'm going to do is I'm going to break down the two main systems that we have on the guitar, or at least two of the systems we have for guitar, uh, of course, opinions vary as to the, uh, the effectiveness and the application of these ideas, but I can certainly give you my take on two of the most useful ways of seeing how material is organized on the guitar. This is essentially what this is like. It's a, a form of guitar filing system, if you like. How do we organize the information to fit around the guitar neck? So the two principal systems around chords in this instance, we're gonna see this around chords, but remember of course that scales, arpeggios, licks and phrases, musical ideas and so on, can be situated around chord shapes as well. When we start getting into scales, we start getting into the idea of uh, 
of moving through various positions. So maybe that might be a subject for next week, just for the purpose of simplicity or for the purpose of focus. What I'm going to do today, if I may, is I'm going to restrict our gaze to, uh, to chord shapes. So in this instance, again, just for the purposes of uh, simplicity and so that we can focus on one thing, I'm going to restrict ourselves to even one type of chord, although every type of chord can be fitted into this system and the other respective uh, different ways to organize the guitar fretboard. So the cage system uh, might be a good place to begin. It's a way of dividing the guitar into five distinct areas that relates to C, A, G, E, and D forms, meaning they resemble how those chords would feel if you played them as open chords. So if you play an open C, we we'll do, we'll do this as seventh chords today. So if you were to play an open C7, and of course there's choices for an open C7, there's a C major chord, we can add the seven, or we could play it like so, or we could choose any of these kind of different variations based upon which string groups. But I guess if we, we were looking at the most common C7, it's gonna be this one. And then we might look at an open A7, which would be this one. An open G7, again, our choices vary. You've got this one, as in the Giuliani G7 with the D in it. Giuliani studies uses that G7. You've also got this one, the kind of country type G7. I like that one personally. The one I like the least is this one. It sounds like a tritone on the top. It sounds quite dissonant, but they're all available to you. Uh, where were we? So we had C7, A7, G7, whichever one take your pick, you know. E7, I'm gonna preference that to this version of E7, because I, I wanna keep some fingers free. And D7. And of course that can be played as an inversion with the F sharp in the bass, if you want a more kind of full, fuller sound. So there's our basic five position system as it were, in the open, five uh, open chords, C7, A7, G7, E7, and D7. Okay, so let's deal first off with what Caged is good at, right? Caged is immensely good at mapping out areas of the fretboard. So for me, it's more like a fretboard GPS system than it is any kind of way to effectively go through mapping out all the possible options or moving through the chord shapes in some kind of systematic approach, which is gonna be useful for me in terms of things like voice leading, or it's gonna be useful for me in terms of uh, chord melody and so on. Because one of the problems you get with caged is, because the intervallic break up, uh, breakdown of each chord or makeup of each chord is different, then when we move from one shape to the next, then the, sort of the, the way the intervals stack up changes from chord to chord. In fact, you can have a situation where you go from one chord shape to another, and notes on certain strings don't move at all, they stay in the same location. Which I think is one of the, point, the points of contention about the cage system is that when we move from one chord to the next, we may end up dropping some notes out, some notes stay where they are, some notes move. It's a bit inconsistent, right? But that, in a way, is a misunderstanding as to what it's use, useful for and what it's used for. It's used mainly, certainly by me anyway, that's, that's the only person I can speak of with any real authority. It's used by me anyway, as a system for outlining areas of activity. In fact, you may have noticed the opening choruses in minor swing. I purposefully, and this was an intentional thing in fact, I purposefully chose to play the first chorus around here, around this area, the second chorus I moved to here, the third chorus I moved to a different area, The fourth, by the fourth chorus I kind of uh, took those restrictions off and just allowed it to go wherever it went to. But at least in terms of having a plan to begin with, it was like, okay, I know where I'm gonna begin, rather like having a, a fretboard bullet point notes for want of a better word. So with this in mind, the cage system is immensely good at mapping out specific areas of the neck, right? What it's not so good at, is things like moving through each inversion of a chord where every note moves along, or you all move up one seat, you move along the bus, yeah? And that's the second system which we're gonna look at, which is more based upon inversions and moving voicings through all of the permutations of inversions. 
Now, the beauty of that, of course, is that there's a predictable outcome when I move from one voice in for C7 to the next voice in. Each note moves by a specific distance. It moves up to the next note, either up or down in the chord. And that has obvious benefits as well. So we'll look at that in a moment. But first off, let's define the five cage shapes for C7. Let's now take our five dominant seventh voice sins and map them around the fretboard in a single key. So here's our C7 playing a C shape, if that makes sense. So the C shape or voice in the chord of C7. Maybe we do a one, four, five. If we want that to be F7, that needs to go here. And G7, like so. So of course in this instance I'm excluding the open strings because they're not necessarily, that open E string is not going to work so well against the F7. Uh, so just the fretted strings. So what I need to do is keep track of where the root notes are in each voicing. So in this one it's on string 5 or string 1 and it maps out the octave here, likewise. Now, another of Mark's questions was about how this is helpful for us as an improviser. So around each of these voices, so say we, we plump for G for a moment, I will see all the other useful improvisational tools. So I'll see a triad arpeggio, whatever finger I might choose for that. So where I said, I think in a lick last week, I said it starts off with a C form arpeggio. What that meant is there's the chord, G7, based on that C shape, and the arpeggio triad is in the same fretboard geographical area. It's kind of like, that's its GPS, you know, it lives here. And what we can do is we can find all the other relevant things. So maybe like the triad, and there's different fingerings, of course, or the seventh, Maybe the major or dominant pentatonic, or the mixolydian mode. So if I've got a lick that's there, in that area, I would say that was C shape. I know it did deviate a little bit there and moved around, which is connected to the next shape. But say we play something that's explicitly from that area, blues that go like. So if, when BB King does those, I would classify that as around the C shape area. And it doesn't matter if it's a BB King lick or if it's. Pat Martino thing or Django thing, you know, where he goes, oh, whatever, you know. That's still this area. So what we do, that we see that as kind of a pocket of activity of things that can be seen that will happen around that particular shape. So what, what have you got in G7 around that area of the neck? And you can move up or down by a fret or two, but it's basically in that area. Okay, so that's the C shape. So C7, and everything I played here could be mapped down to there as well. Okay, what do you have for F7 or G7 or any other 7, of course? Okay, next one along. Always follows the word caged as well. C shape. Next one up will be an A form. So that's the open A chord used to play a C7 chord now. Rather like if I put a capo on the third fret and I played an A7, what's going to come out now is a C7. And I can put all of those same tools that I placed around this chord shape, I can go find them in orbit around this chord. So again, I could go C7 using the A shape, I could go F7 using the A shape, and we could go G7. So if I go... kind of licks and phrases that I'm playing that are gravitating around that particular area. In this case, I'm just choosing this as a static C7 or G7. Forgive me, static G7. Okay. 
So we can do the formal things, you know, triad arpeggios, seventh arpeggios, uh, dominant pentatonic, I think I played before. Mixolydian mode. Whatever you know, whatever you've got. In this particular area of the fretboard, you know, what have you got around that chord? Blues lick, bop licks, whatever it might be. So that's an area of activity, in this case G7, and I'm asking myself, what, what have I got to say about G7 in that area? Maybe that's different from that area. And there's two ways of looking at this. You might say, well, can I play the same exact musical information here and here, just by way of an exercise? Or there's also an argument to be said, well, wouldn't it be cool if you had different things, maybe things that suit this area, that really feel good, you know, kinesthetically that work in this area, as opposed to this area? And this is how you can end up with certain phrases that really identify with C-shape phrasing, or a phrase that might, like, so for example, that Django phrase. That for me is really associated with that shape. Okay, there's a stretch at the, at the top of it, but so it follows the triad shape that comes from that area. And I probably wouldn't play that exact phrase in any of the other forms. It would modify and become something else to suit the fingering. So. On we go. So we had C7 with a C shape, uh, and then the F and G, of course. Then we had C7 with the A shape, and then the F and G, of course. Now the next one could be C7 with the G shape. Now, we've got a few choices here for this chord. Some players play this. And that's okay, you know, it's cool. Uh, George Harrison uses that shape in, uh, in Get Back, you know. Now, I know it's not in this key, um, but if imagine just for a moment, imagine if it were. There you go. So that's, that's where that chord can get used as a, a kind of a top voice in for a seventh chord. So that's one voice in, the one that I quite like. This kind of thing, you put the bass on or the third underneath it. It doesn't really matter because it's not necessarily... I don't really use these voicings as a systematic way of moving through the chords. I'm using it as a geographical reference point to go, OK, what other C things do I have in that area? It's not so much that I'm going to strum these chords. I've got a better way of doing this, which I'll go over in a moment. OK, so then we see... Uh, well, first off, let's follow the same form. Let's then go... Here's our F version of the same thing. And there's our G version. F7 and G7, go back to uh, C, I'll do this one in C. So I ask myself, what's the triad? So I'll have a triad that fits around that. Yeah, so there's a triad finger, and I'll do it really slow. Do I have a seventh? Do I have like a dominant pentatonic? A mixolydian mode. Making sense? So those kind of fr that phrasing that I played there, because it was in that geographical area, I would think of that as G form phrasing. So all those kind of uh, pentatonic major things. You know, if we play the pentatonic major in this position. Um, and you might think of them as being like, well, it's like A minor. No, it's not, because it's relating to this chord. So, okay, that was more triadic or seventh. That area. And that's unique and specific to that area as opposed to what happened here with the C shape, the A shape, and the next one being the G shape. Okay, so this follows the way caged, C form, 
A form, G form, so you know what's coming next, the E form. This is sometimes referred to as the E form area, because it's like an open E chord. And around that we can play the triad, the seventh arpeggio, the dominant pentatonic, the mixolydia mode, these phrases that's all stuff that happens in this area of the neck so I know I'm kind of improvising and moving around it quick but I'm just trying to show you that each area has got its potential for musical ideas so I could play something here you know, or maybe here the same thing with the high baby king uh, the A form I think uh, what did I play uh, the A form Django thing, yeah, okay. Here I might go bluesy thing, perhaps. Here, Chuck Berry, you know. yeah, So, a lot of Charlie Christian's lines are based around the E form. A lot. In fact, a lot of guitar players, we really we hammer that E form, really. But you should be equally well versed in all the other areas. So again, I could move that to F and to G. So, so far, that's four of the five. So that's the C shape, the A shape, the G shape. Take your pick. You know, I like that one. Uh, but whatever. As I say, the chords themselves are not that important. Because we've got a better system for chords I'm going to show you in a moment. Okay, then we have the E form. I mean, variations exist, of course. So John Lennon with his... I always think of that kind of as the Beatles chord shape because so many of those Beatles tunes, like Sgt. Peppers and things like that, this chord moved around the neck. C, F, G. Okay, we have one left, which is the D form. So D7 could be this. So now it could be a red house shape. Car wash, that kind of thing. So that's uh, C7 played using a D form, one of the least used because to, to be able to track this one, we need to be really, really savvy with the notes on the D string. And for many guitar players, that's an Achilles heel, that is. So we uh, might not necessarily be able to jump in on many of these other chord changes because you really, really need to know that that's an F for that to be F7 and you really need to know that's a G to confidently just jump in and know where, where's A flat seven using that form? Well, how well do you know where A flat is on the D string? That's, that's where you need to really kind of dig deep and be honest with yourself. So again, there's our chord shape. What did we play before? We played triads. Now we've got choices for fingerings. We can move them kind of either side. We've got a seventh chord that we can play. I'll play this a little bit slower, shall I? Okay, we've got the dominant pentatonic, like uh, we have in all the other shapes. Lydian mode, same same deal again. Now you can choose with these things if you want. This is sometimes it's cool to go from the root notes outwards. So all these phrases. phrases that are coming from around that D7 chord, you know. That's coming from that chord. So what we've got now is the same chord in five different places. Let's do what we did with the others. C7, F7, G7. Okay, 
So what this now means is that I've, I've got C everywhere. Yeah, that's kind of a cool thing. Of course, the alternative uh, fingerings. If you prefer, take the note from the high E string, put it on the low E string, and you get this bassier sound and fuller sounding chord. Our next step is to move through a variety of different keys in the same area. So let's just keep this to one, four, five. But in terms of, uh, again, to answer Mark's question about how is this useful for an improvising musician, uh, maybe playing jazz tunes, is what I'll do, move through an entire tune, all of the changes in, in a piece, but without moving position. I'm also going to do this with a different type of uh, chord connection, which we'll get to in a moment. But uh, for now, let's stick to caged. So in this area, we had C7, and we said F7 could be the same chord shape, repositioned all the way up here, and G could be here. That's kind of clumsy, though, however, when we could equally find an F7 here, and we can find a G7 here as well, and a C here. So in this one area, I can find C, I can find F, and G. And all of the stuff that goes around C, so I could play a C, what should I pick? I'll play C7 arpeggio. Okay, and then around the F, and around that I've got the associated F7. And guess what, the G, and around that I've got the associated G7, and the different fingering option. So of course I could take uh, smaller string groups of that, you know, I could go C7, just on the bottom three strings if I felt like. And then F7 on the bottom. And we can exploit these connections when we improvise. G7. And so on. Of course I'm moving through this pretty quickly. Because the uh, the implications of this are, are far-reaching, but this is really a sort of primer uh, first. To why would you even look into caged? What's it good at? What's it useful for? What can you use it for? And I think this is one of the problems sometimes with learning information is if you're not really sure what you, what it's good at doing, what can you use it to? What's this tool going to allow us to do? Then we can try to apply a system. Uh, for an objective that is not really suited and then we think it's futile or it doesn't really work and what it might be is it's just being used to do the wrong job you know it's like choose the right tools that's that's maybe good advice so okay so so as i say caged is more geographical right? it's about the geographical locations so this is the c shape f g we'll go to the next area now so we can go to the a form c so I ask myself, where's the nearest? Uh, we'll, we'll keep to C7, F7, G7. In that same area, can I make that transition? There's F7. It's not great voice leading, but once again, this isn't what it's for. It's about saying, here's an area of the neck. What can you do around that? Here's an area of the neck. What can you do around this? Here's an area of the neck for G7. What can we do around that? Can we connect those things together with some of those other tools, the scales, the arpeggios, the lines that go with it, blues, licks, bebop lines, Django phrases, whatever you do, can you do? What have you got to say about that, basically? What have you got to say about this? And if you so choose to play a different form, it doesn't make any difference, it's not important. Okay, it's just a geographical location, okay? So then we have C, F, and G7. Okay. And then all of those things that we did before, uh, C7, F7, G7. So I'm 
just mapping out their C7, F7, G7 in that area. Give or take maybe a fret or so if you need to go there to finish a phrase off. But this is what case is really all about. C goes to F, goes to G, goes to C. Next position, C shape, A shape. What comes next? G shape, C7. Take your pick, you know. There's our C7, there's our F. And there's our G. As I say, terrible voice leading, but that's not what it's for. So C7, F7, G7, whichever. And then back to C7 again. George with it. In that case, I know it's in a different key, but you, you take my point. Okay. So there's uh, C, F, G. And if you wish, you could take it through this cycle. You know, don't just stop there. You know, you could go C7, F7, B flat 7, E flat 7, A flat 7, D flat 7, G flat, B, E, A, D. Where did I start? I forgot where I started. G, C. Where, whichever one I started on, you go around the cycle, you ascend in frets. That's in a cycle of fourth, so you can do it in fifths as well, of course. Okay, so we had C shape, A shape, G shape, whichever one, E shape, and, oh yeah, E shape, that's what we're up to. E shape, okay, so there's the E shape. That goes to A shape, F7, goes to C shape. G7. I mean, I don't think in those, these terms, in, like sort of spelling it out, you just see them as chord forms going, there's C, where's the nearest F? There, can I change to G in this same area? Yeah, can, can I play the arpeggios that fit around those things? There you go, so there's C7, I'll come down F7, I'll go up G7, and then come down to so, okay, and everything else that we did that fitted around that, you know, that you can play the the, the dominant pentatonic in double stops if you want, and then you change that to F and G and so on. Yeah, um, making sense. Okay, and then the final one C shape, A shape, G shape, E shape, D shape. Here's our C7. Then we'll go to F7. As that's high voiced, I'll pick this one perhaps. And then G. As I say, terrible voice leading. That's not what it's for. So F C. And again. The arpeggio that fits around that and everything else. And then there's our F7. And you'll have licks and phrases and runs and devices and everything that you've got that fits around them. So this is how if you're playing a blues in C, I'd want to be able to go. be able to go So that's playing C, F, and G in each area. Okay, so C, F, G, C, F, G, C, whichever of the voice ends. And the, the voice leading, as I say, is horrific in some instances. And that's maybe what turns people off, you know, that the, the voice lead is not so great. So C, F, G, and then we're back to where we began. By this point, you've heard me mention the voice leading problems with the cage system. 
So I'm going to propose a second system that you might find to be more useful here. And that is moving each voice in through its inversions. So we'll continue with C7 and we'll start with a chord that I'm sure we all know. In fact, we saw it before. And I'm only going to play four notes this time. That's a root, fifth, seven, three voice in, sometimes referred to as a drop two. Meaning we take a voice in that in this instance would normally go five, seven, root three, it would be in that inversion. We take the note second from the top, five, seven, root three, take the root and put it on the bottom. So put it down to the bottom of the chord. And that gives us a bigger spread. It makes it more playable on the guitar. And it means that the range from lower to higher is greater. The notes are not all bunched together. It's all round a really good idea. And anyway, this is how it sounds. Now you can transfer this voice in. So I'm gonna call this string groups two through to five. And it has the root and the bass, and it has the third and the treble. And it's important that we recognize what every note is, but particularly those two, root and third. So I can move that now to different string groups. You can go or on the top. So, so that's the same voice. Now, of course, as it's a dominant seven, we can then raise the seven to make a major seven. And once again, we've now got three voices for that chord. So you take the dominant seven, raise the seven. We raise it, becomes a major seven. Okay. Or we take the third lower it and we now have a minor seven. So down a seven. Making sense? Okay, now we'll go back to the dominant seven. Our system now here requires us to move this through each of the inversions. And that means we move every note along one note in the chord. So the root becomes the third, the fifth becomes the seventh, the seventh becomes the root, and the third becomes the fifth. And that gives us this chord. Move that along one more, we get this chord. One more for this chord. For this particular voicing, we now have 12 options. We have four inversions with three different string groups. Now, I'm gonna play through these things at speed uh, it's definitely in your, in your interest to map these out yourself. I found when I stared at them in books already written out for me, they just didn't go in. I had to really get stuck in, get a map of the fretboard out, write them out, plot them out on the neck. Then I began to possess them. They, be, they began to be something that w was mine, that I could see on the guitar as I was playing, rather than something that you collect in a book. And then if you remove the book, you can't remember them. So I'm going to go through these pretty quickly but you can always pause the video and uh, map them out or just spend an evening mapping them out and then look over them. If it takes a month to learn them or two months, it really doesn't matter. It's not about how long it takes. It's about how efficiently and effectively you've learned these things. So let, let me run this uh, for you. Here's C7. We'll do the middle strings first because that might be the way we, we begin. With the root and the bass and the third and the treble. Okay, with the third and the bass and the fifth and the treble with the 5th in the bass, the 7th in the treble, uh, with the 7th in the bass and the root in the treble. Okay. I can drag them across to the top strings, root position, with the 3rd in the bass. I hesitate to say 1st inversion because the bass player could be playing a tonic. Well, for now we'll call it 1st inversion, but we will establish the difference between an inversion and a voicing because of course the bass player is not duty bound to play the third. That's third and fifth. This is fifth and seventh. And then we have seventh and root. And any of this information can be repeated on the bottom four strings. Root position. Then our first inversion is, if we're going with that terminology, second inversion, and the third inversion. So the beauty of this, what this has got going for the caged hasn't, is I can go from the lowest position, I can go to seventh, with the root, with the third, with 
a fifth, the seventh, and I'm giving you the bass note here. Or the root, and the third. Yeah, as, as high as you can reach. Can I get it? Yeah. Just about. Oh, it's pretty tough. Yeah, I could get it with this, these fingers, maybe, perhaps. Yeah, there you go. I'm not going to be jumping on that chord at any point soon on this guitar, though. Trust me. Okay. So that's really useful. Not, uh, not least because it allows us to... Uh, to use voice lead in, in an intelligent way. So if I were now, let's just take the treble strings and we'll stick with our C, F and G. Of course, you know what I want you to do with this now, don't you? I want you to take your C7 and make it into a C minor seven and take your C7 and turn it into a C major seven. And of course, and anything else, you know, that goes with that C major seven flat five, if you want, you know, everything that you can do with seven chords. Okay, and you take your C7, and you make it into C major 7, or C minor 7. Whatever you want it to be, C, C7, becomes C major 7, C minor 7. What this allows us to do is do things like 2, 5, 1. And the voice leading is really, really good. You know, the voice leading means we don't move, we don't really have to move to go between these chords. So that can go like so, and notes hardly move at all. And they're all in the same register. Rather than the cage shapes, they jump about all over the place. But this is more about voice leading, smooth uh, maneuverability for each of the voicings, and also about going through each and every option in a predictable and a systematic way. So if we take our C, F, and G7, just on the treble strings, just as, a, uh, as an ending thing for this, we could go... C7 could be this. Uh, what are we going to do here? We're going to go C7. And then we might go F7 could be. And G7 could be. See how close they are and how connected they are? C7 could be this. F7 could be this. And G7 could be. And they're connected. C7, F7, G7. C7. F7, G7. Repeat this procedure for every set of strings so that you're not restricted to just playing on the treble strings so that you can do the exact same thing. You can do your C7 here. Do your F7 will be here. Your G7 will be here. Or C7. You get the idea? So there's a voice leading connection there with... One, four, five dominant chords. You can do this with whole tunes. That's something that I spend a great deal of time doing. Take an entire piece in the on the lowest four strings between the open string and the fifth fret. If you can't play it there, you don't really know it well enough, you know. And then you can then see lines to fit around those chords and arpeggios to fit around those chords. Chords, uh, scales, uh, lines, pentatonics, you name it, licks all the things that you can play around each of those areas. Now, this is an awful lot of work, right? I'm, I'm not unaware of the fact that this is in many instances a kind of lifetime's work where you keep coming back at this, but it's super valuable. This is really kind of knowing the instrument, knowing the geography of the, of the guitar. And by no means do I feel as if I've completely got every single aspect of this down because there's so many different chord types to consider, major, minor, dominant, and so on. They, they get used all the time. So in that instance, there's no real excuse for not knowing these, to be fair. Um, but then there are some uh, less common used chords, maybe more exotic sounds. And you'll find yourself getting into certain sounds. Like I'm, the sound that I'm using a lot in my compositions at the moment is a diminished major seven. Diminished triad with a major seven on top. It's almost like a major triad with a flat nine instead of the root. And that's been something I've been mapping out, finding all the drop two, drop three voicings, finding all the various different ways I can play that move it through each of the permutations through all keys. Again, you could take that dominant seven thing, cycle it through fourths or fifths. There's such a lot to do with this. So I'm aware of the fact that there's a, an enormous amount of work here in this session and it's really tightly packed. I know I'm going fast. My, uh, my Zoom meeting is looming, so I've, I've got to try and get this out as quick as I can. So just to end today, I'm gonna to run through C7 from the lowest position to the highest position using these what we call drop two voices. So here's the lowest one with the fifth and the 
bass, and the seven in the treble. It's nice for chord melody to acknowledge the treble notes because that could be your melody note, yeah? So the next one I'm expecting to see all moves up one. So I'm expecting to see the seventh in the bass and the tonic in the treble, which it is. Then I have a choice then to go for the roots. I can stick on the same string group, so I'll choose to go across. Because this and this are the same thing, yeah? They're identical. A cage would reflect them differently. But in our voicing system, we see them as the same thing on a different string group. And that's root and third on the top. Then we have third and fifth. The next one is going to be fifth and seven. And seven and root again. I have, do you have choices here? Okay, that's the same chord. And we're back to root and third again. Low and high. Then the next one is third and fifth. And then this bad boy that I can't play because of my cutaway. And that's uh, fifth and seven, and there's no way I'm getting that next one. Uh, so once you've done that with dominant seven, do it with major seven, with minor seven, minor seven flat five as well. Don't forget, let's not forget that one. Dominant seven, minor seven, minor seven flat five. And make certain you've got that through each of the inversions. Now everyone knows that one, yeah? But we've got to move it through each of the inversions. And this is how you're going to be able to see the chord everywhere. And if you take your time with this, there's no rush about these things. This is an important part of playing the guitar. But, you know, we're in, what are we in now? Week 42. So if you followed this from the start, that's flown by. For me, that's flown by. If you give yourself 40 weeks to learn all these chord shapes, you'd be well there. You'd easily get them down in that amount of time. And let's be honest, do you remember, you know, when the pandemic started? It feels, I know it felt like a Christmas that... The January was going to take forever with everything being closed. It's gone by in a heartbeat. So if you give yourself a year to get all of these chords down, you'd easily do it so long as you keep coming back at it persistently, progressively, and you do it in detail, and you do this with focus and with some sense of purpose. Of course, then we start putting it into 2-5-1s, 1-4-5s, 1-6-2-5s, rhythm changes, blues, you name it. You can throw this at it and you'll come out a much better player with a much clearer understanding of the fretboard as a result. And I think both systems, the cage system, and this, what we might call, uh, what should we call it, interval inversion or chord inversion system, both of these things work in tandem pretty well. I tend to use the caged for geographical things, seeing phrasing, improvising, lines, licks, and what have you, whereas I see this other system, the drop, system two and three as a way of uh, achieving smooth and connected voice leading and how the notes can be moved and the chords can be moved in a systematic way that's predictable and dependable. I hope that you enjoyed this kind of deep dive approach this week. I thought I'd stick with really one topic and really uh, dig deep as we say. Uh, there's plenty to be getting stuck into here. I don't think there's ever an end to this. I feel as if the more I look at this, the more I find there is yet to be discovered. But that said and done, it's really kind of, what, for want of a better word, really honest practice. It's really kind of super helpful. I find it just allows me to play better knowing where I am and what's happening on the guitar. In a way, it's kind of like if you practice this stuff efficiently, you can sort of not think about it, rather like if you've got a great understanding of grammar. We can speak fluently and never have to concern ourselves with thinking of the mechanics of grammar in one iota whilst we're speaking. Maybe if you then were to learn a second language, we'd need to think about how to use nouns properly or where verbs go and you know, what kind of uh, tenses we need to uh, employ in any given circumstance. But for the most part, we just do this automatically. And I'm hoping that these shapes become automatic things for you too. As always, I hope you enjoyed this week. Please keep the comments, the shares, uh, any likes, suggestions or requests coming. We've got 10 sessions left and then we're on to other, on to pastures new. So with this in mind, get your questions in now because once it's gone, it's gone. We've got 10 more weeks left. So please shout out if there's anything you'd like me to cover in those remaining sessions. And I'll see you next week for number 43.